Hello, everyone. This is the 43rd episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we welcome back Mr. David Stewart of the Scotland Episodes Football Magazine and Mr. Clark Gillies as we discuss the matches of the Scotland national team for the 1984-85 season. Last time we left off in the spring of 1984 as Scotland were defeated 2-0 to eventual Euro 84 champions France. For the 1984-85 season, the 1986 World Cup qualifier started. And Scotland's objective was to qualify for their fourth straight World Cup after the disappointment of the 1984 Euro qualifiers. Scotland were in a balanced group with recent Euro runners-up Spain, home nation neighbors Wales, and Iceland. One nation was guaranteed to qualify while the runner-up had a chance for a playoff. But that's for the following season. Welcome back, gentlemen. Hi, it's good to be back. The season 1984-85 started with a friendly at Glasgow's Hampton Park on September 12th as Scotland took on Yugoslavia. So for this match, Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen in goal, Steve Nicole of Liverpool, Arthur Albison of Man United, Alex McLeish and Willie Miller of Aberdeen. Captain the side, Graham Souness. He had just joined Sampdoria in Italy for this season. Kenny Daglish of Liverpool. He'd be replaced by Paul Storrock of Dundee United in the 56th minute. John Wark of Liverpool. He'd be replaced by Paul McStay of Celtic in the 46th minute. Morris Johnson of Celtic. James Bett of Lokeren in Belgium, and Davy Cooper of Rangers Glasgow, and he'd be replaced by Charlie Nicholas in the 60th minute. Now, I'll quickly go through the Yugoslavia lineup. You have Dragan Pantelic of Radniki Nis, he replaced by Ranko Stojic of Dinamo Zagreb in the 46th minute. Branko Milius of Heidek Split, Mirsad Baljic of Zeljeznikar Sarajevo, Miodrag Jezic of Partizan Belgrade, Vladimir Matijevic of Velez Mostar, he'd be replaced by Davor Jozic of Sarajevo in the 65th minute. Capping the side, Lyubomir Radanovic of Partizan Belgrade, Edin Bahtic of Zeljeznikar Sarajevo, Blaz Sliskovic of Heidek Split. Fadil Vokri of Pristina, he replaced by Darko Panchev of Vardar Skopje. Petar Georgievsky of Vardar Skopje, he replaced by Nenad Grakan of Rijeka in the 46th minute. And Zoran Batrovic of Pristina. Side managed for the first time by Milos Milotinovic, brother of Bora Milotinovic. This was a very good Scottish victory. Scotland wearing their red kit won this match 6-1. And just quickly going through the goal scorers, Davy Cooper scored in the 12th minute, Graham Souness in the 18th minute, Daglish in the 31st, Paul Storak in the 65th, Mo Johnson in the 67th, and Charlie Nicholas in the 80th minute. And actually, Fadil Vokri had given Yugoslavia the lead in the 11th minute. So a very good win for Scotland. What do you guys remember from this match? I suppose it's that thing. It's a it's the greatest game that nobody ever went to. I mean, it was only a crowd of was it something like eighteen thousand? Oh yes, yes, eighteen thousand. Yeah. If I want to, yeah. Is that the game Glasgow City Council were on strike or something? There was all sorts of things because it was that I think, in the, but there was definitely a TV strike, the cameraman mm-hmm. strike. Aye, because there's only there's only grainy kind of not professional footage of the match. There's only like it's clearly it's only. Cheap camera that's been taking photograph- uh, videos of the match. Yeah. <laughs> just to point out that Steve Archibald, he had just joined Barcelona this season, but he was not released for this match. Barcelona did not allow it. Also, to point out that this was John Wark's 29th and final cap. His first cap had been in 1979. 
So the thing is, Ward was he not end up the top Liverpool Liverpool goal scorer of that season as well. I think he broke his leg around this time. But another thing about this match is this was actually Alex Ferguson's first match as assistant manager. One thing that needs to be pointed out that even though six one win against a side like Yugoslavia is very impressive. We must point out a number of things about this Yugoslavian side. Yugoslavia had just had a disastrous 1984 Euros where they lost all their matches. As a result, their manager, Todor Veselinovic, was sacked. So for this match, Milos Milotinovic's very first match, there were a number of first caps. I believe Vokri, Stoic, Jozic, Panchev, Batic, Georgievsky and Batrovich. They were earning their very first caps. And Grakan and Baljic, I think that was their, only their second caps. And out of these players, I think the only names that really stand out are Jozic and Panchev, who were part of the 1990 World Cup squad. Obviously, Panchev, everyone remembers for the 91 Red Star Champions Cup victory. It was a team that was in complete disarray at this point. For some of them, Batrovic or Georgievsky, Batic, this was their one and only cap. Uh, for the others, like I think Pantelic and Matievich, this was like his Matievich's third and final cap. So this was a very weak Yugoslavian and Yugoslavian side and inexperienced side. And they were missing just just to name some of the names that were missing for Yugoslavia. The Vujovic twins, Zoran and Zlatko, Ivan Gudelj, Faruk Hadzibedzic, Mehmed Bazdarvic, Milos Sestic, Safet Susic, Nenad Stojkovic, the young Dragan Stojkovic, and Vladimir Zayec. I think the disastrous Euros had forced them to do some experimentation and or none of these players were available. The 6-1 victory has to be viewed in context. Although anytime a team defeats another one 6-1 internationally, especially a decent side like Yugoslavia, it's a point to take. What was the press coverage that you remember, given all this? I mean, they were very enthusiastic about the win. Beforehand, they were I read one of them was questioning why Jim Bett and David Cooper were on the same side. They're both left-sided players. They didn't think there was any balance there. But I think at this point, you see that Jim Bett and David Cooper were amongst the best players, certainly for the first half of the, the World Cup qualifiers. No, they were very ecstatic, I suppose, in many ways, you know, because it, even if Yugoslavia were seen to be a lesser side at that point, Scotland teams don't often score a lot of goals, even when they should. So I think 6 1 was there to be celebrated, to be honest. Yeah, and from six different goal scorers as well. Yeah, that's pretty impressive in itself. Is this Steve Nichols' first cap as well? This, this game? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He hadn't been getting in because of Richard Goff, to be honest. Yeah. And Goff becomes a important player as again in this tournament as well, you know, coming up. One of the other things I suppose is actually on that night, it's the fact that Wales are getting beat by Iceland as well is a big thing in terms of the World Cup qualifying. And also just for kit enthusiasts, I think this was the last time they were this red kit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The- uh, yeah. Do we know we were in Belfast? Come on, or was that the season before? That was season no, before, before, December that season before? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're moving on to the swimming shorts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the World Cup qualifiers proper started on October 17th, 1984, again at uh, Hampton Park at Glasgow against Iceland. We should also preface by saying that even though Iceland were the weakest team in this group, they were not as weak as, let's say, Luxembourg or Cyprus or Malta or Albania. They were at this time, they were just like maybe a level above them in the sense that you really had to work it to beat them, especially if you're playing away. 
for this match, Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen and Goal, Steve Nicol of Liverpool, Arthur Albison of Man United, Alex McLeish and Willie Miller of Aberdeen, Graham Sunes, captain decide from Sampdoria in Italy, Kenny Daglish of Liverpool. He replaced by Charlie Nicholas of Arsenal in the 70th minute, Paul McStay of Celtic, Morris Johnson of Celtic, James Bett of Lokeren in Belgium, and Davy Cooper of Rangers. So I think it's the same identical side as a match against Yugoslavia, it looks like. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, McStay came in for work. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. He's starting the game this time. Yes. Let me quickly go through the Iceland side. You have Bjarni Sigurdsson of IA Akrans in goal, Thor Grimur Thrainson of Valur Reykjavik, Magnus Helgi Bergs of Eintracht Braunschweig in West Germany, Savar Johnson of Circle Bruges in Belgium. Arnie Svensson of IA Akrans, Janus Goodlogson of Fortuna Köln in West Germany, capping the side Asger Sigur Vinson of Stuttgart in West Germany. He had just won the Bundesliga title the previous season with Stuttgart. He was one of the classier players in this Iceland side. He had had spells at Bayern Munich and I believe Standard Liège previously. You have Atli Edvaldson of Fortuna Dusseldorf in West Germany. Arnor Gudjonsson of Anderlecht in Belgium. Of course, father of Edur Gudjonsson of Chelsea and Barcelona fame. Ragnar Margerson of IB Keflavikur. And Petur Petursson of Feyenoord in Holland and the side managed by Tony Knapp. So they have a few players playing in the Western leagues, but yeah, obviously they were seen as the weaker team in this group. So for this match, Scotland took the lead in the 26th minute from Paul McStay. It was his very first goal for Scotland. There's a short corner on the left side from Davy Cooper, and Paul McStay scores with a downward header. In the 40th minute, Paul McStay and Scotland doubled the lead. It was a beautiful long-range shot from outside of the box to the top corner. Scotland scored a third goal in the 74th minute from Charlie Nicholas. Johnson gets the ball in midfield, feeds it out to the right-hand side. And for some reason, Willie Miller's there. <laughs> and he sort of does lob the ball over, and Nicholas is practically on the line just to... Tap it in, more or less. Comfortable victory for the first match of the World Cup qualifiers. What was the press outlook at this time? I think Paul McStay again was in the papers the next day. You know, just not just in the back pages, but in the middle pages and things like that. He obviously was at this point still considered a wonder kid of some sorts, but he'd established himself well in the Celtic team by this point. His second goal was quite typical of him. You know, long range hitting. Mm-hmm. The shot um, from out the box. Yeah, it, it, it's funny as you watch it, it just seems to open up for him. The forwards take the defenders away and he's got this massive gap. Strikes it beautifully though. Yes. As for the header, I don't think he had too many of them over the years. No, I don't remember. No, always always shots or... Yeah. But that never a header, I don't remember. Nicholas... That's his fifth goal in 10 games, but it's his last Scotland goal. Oh, is it? This is the very last yeah. one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think he would get maybe a half a dozen more caps, but this was his last yeah, goal. 10 more. And the fans, if you watch the footage on YouTube, the fans are actually crying his name is when he actually scores. So I think there must be a, a feeling that this is him clicking at last with Scotland, but what was to be, we'll find it out. We come to the the next qualifier on November 14th, 1984, again at Glasgow's Hampton Park, against Spain, who we mentioned had just finished runners-up in the 1984 Euros. And going into this, probably would have been looked upon as a favorites for the group as a result. So for this match, Juxtin selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen and Goal. 
Steve Nicol of Liverpool, Arthur Albiston of Man United, Alex McLeish, Willie Miller of Aberdeen, Graham Sunes, capping the side, Sampdoria, Italy, Kenny Daglish, Liverpool, Paul McStay, Celtic, Mo Johnson of Celtic, James Bett of Lokeren in Belgium, and Davy Cooper of Rangers Glasgow. So the consistent side. And going through the Spain lineup, managed by Miguel Munoz. Capping the side, Luis Arconada of Real Sociedad. Santiago Urquiaga of Athletic Bilbao. Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón. Andoni Goicoechea of Athletic Bilbao. Jose Antonio Camacho of Real Madrid. Victor Munoz of Barcelona. Urtubi of Athletic Bilbao. He be replaced by Francisco Carrasco of Barcelona in the 80th minute. Juan Senor of Real Zaragoza. Rafael Gordillo of Real Betis. Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid. Hipolito Rincon of Real Betis. And he be replaced by Emilio Butragueño of Real Madrid in the 46th minute. This match has gone down as one of best Scotland performances, especially against a good side. Scotland took the lead in the 33rd minute through Mo Johnson. A corner from the left side was flicked over to the far side and a hard volley was taken from the right the edge of the box. Arconada did well to parry this attempt, but Mo Johnson was just at the doorstep and he just headed it into an empty net. So that was the first goal. Scotland doubled the lead in the 42nd minute. So Cooper took a corner from the left side. It reached to the right side and James Bett crossed and Mo Johnson headed the goal again. So Scotland took a 2-0 lead into the halftime. So in the second half, Spain pulled the goal back. In the 65th minute, Gordillo was fouled by Johnson outside of the box on the left side. Camacho takes the free kick and Goicochea scores with a downward header. I guess it's up to debate. Do you think maybe Leighton should have done better with the attempt? What do yeah, you guys think? Yeah, he looks... Is that, he's kind of expecting it to come higher, I think. Right. And it's just bounced and went right above him. It, it does look kind of awkward in it, shall we say. In any case, just five minutes later, Kenny Daglish restored Scotland's lead. So Nicole takes a throw in from the right side. It's not enough by Cooper to the incoming Daglish, who just goes across and curls the shot around to the corner. And Scotland win 3-1. And at this point, I think they looked a good bet for qualification. I think it was a very impressive performance. Has gone down historically as one of the better performances at home. Obviously, you would know better what the reception was at home. I think it was all about Mo Johnson in many ways. No, just him coming to the fore further than he has already. Two goals against a team like Spain. They're good poachers' goals in some ways, you know what I mean? He, he, particularly the first one. He's the first one on it. He's the first one to think he, has, he might just save that. He's a week off and running for it. Mo Johnson also worked very hard throughout his game and throughout his time in Scotland as well, which very much appreciated. The Glacier's goal that's rated amongst one of his best as well. It's one of those ones where he gets it. You kind of know what he's going to do, but you can see him. He still, he still has to work hard to get that space. They had to end. It's also his last goal for Scotland. I mean, it's also very important because he's wrapped up the match, basically. Yeah, he called the Scotland scoring record with Dennis Law. Oh, yes, yes. So all around, a very good Scottish performance. First half of the season, this fall of 1984, Scotland were very impressive. In fact, France Football Magazine, like every year at the end of the calendar year, they do a ranking of the national teams. And I believe Scotland finished seventh due to these performances which is 
probably their highest. I don't think they've been any higher since in the calendar year. Wales have finally picked up points that night as well. They've beat Iceland 2 1. That's the first game that Ian Rush has been able to play. He oh, yes, he was injured, injured earlier in the season, right? Yeah. Right. One of the things is Mark Hughes after the game is saying that Wales will beat Scotland. He's already got Scotland in his, <laughs> his sight. He's thinking, no, oh, we'll take on Scotland and we'll beat them. Awesome. Some would still be fresh in the mind at this point, Anfield. Yeah. Oh, it's always still fresh in the mind. Yeah. Oh, I know they still talk about it. Seems to be a bit more of a settled team at this point as well. These opening games of the season have been more or less the same the same yeah, players. But the third in a row has made minimal changes. I think they're benefiting from that as well, looks that way. I think one of the things he tried at this point, because they're talking after the game, he was looking to have a friendly in between this game and the Spain game because he, he was aware that Scotland had won three games in a row, but they'd all been at home. So he wanted some away and a wee match, but he never managed to get that. The day they announced the squads for the Spain game, they actually announced the under-21 squad at the same time. And actually, Stuart McCall was simultaneously called up for Scotland and England on the oh, same wow. day. <laughs> oh, really? Um, oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> he decided to go down the route of playing for England at that point, which oh, obviously wow. a few years later he changes his mind about. How did something like that happen? Did like, no one notice? I don't know if at that point maybe they just announced it. I mean, communications not as you know the way it is now, I suppose. So. I would normally have expected there would have been a phone call of some sort, but no, I think they just announced the squads and expect them to turn up. But both. I'm sure if, I'm sure if he said something when he's because he, he does a lot on the radio, I'm sure he says something about who it was pre answer phone days and it was his dad who got the phone call or something and didn't pass on the message or something like that and he didn't find out until afterwards. There's, some, there's a story like that that rings about in the back of my mind that he's told recently. But yeah, he would pick to play for England just a few years later. Then yeah. back to us. I'm trying to remember what club was he playing playing at this time. So Bradford. Bradford at the time. Bradford. Oh yeah, because uh, yeah, I mean his breakthrough was with Everton, if I seem to remember. But that was later in the decade. We come to the 1985 calendar year. Scotland's first match was the return fixture against Spain. It was their first away trip in the World Cup qualifiers. This would be at Sevilla's Ramon Sanchez Pijuan Stadium. For this match, on February 27th, Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen in goal. Richard Guff of Dundee United, making his first appearance of the season, starting ahead of Steve Nicole. Arthur Albiston, Man United, McLeish and Miller, Aberdeen, Graham Sunes, captain of the side, Sampdoria, Paul McStay of Celtic. He'd be replaced by Gordon Strachan of Man United in the 76th minute. This is Strachan's first appearance of the season as well. And he had joined Man United uh, early that season from Aberdeen. Starting for the first time this season, Steve Archibald, who was having a very good season at Barcelona in Spain. And he'd start ahead of Dalglish. In fact, we should mention that uh, both Nicole and Dalglish missed this match through illness. And that's why Guff and Archibald started. This information was not known until an hour before the kickoff. The Spanish press were amazed that Archibald it had taken him so long to be called up by Scotland this season, even though he was having such a good season for Barcelona. Getting back to the lineup, you have rounding out the side, James Bett of Lokeren in Belgium, Mo Johnson of Celtic, and Davy Cooper of Rangers Glasgow. Going through the Spanish side, capping the side, Luis Arconada of Real Sociedad, Gerardo of Barcelona, Andoni Goicochea of Athletic Bilbao, Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón, Jose Antonio Camacho of Real Madrid, 
Juan Senor of Real Zaragoza, Roberto of Valencia, Ricardo Gallego of Real Madrid. He'd be replaced by Julio Alberto of Barcelona in the 82nd minute. Rafael Gordillo of Real Betis. Emilio Butragueño of Real Madrid. And Francisco Clos of Barcelona. Other things to point out that the Scottish training sessions were disrupted by, I guess, local gate crashers. Do you guys know anything about that? Read anything I, about I that? think it's, it's just those typical games we expected at that time in Spanish. Well, from the get-go, you think about Barcelona not releasing Archibald for the friendly. Um, they delayed the announcement of where the match was going to be. Scotland side didn't know until... The Christmas period, I think. Obviously, they took it. That's to right. Film. Well, still, they don't they yeah. don't announce venues until very late. Also, this game, Jim Lane talks about in his book that during the game he was having bananas and oranges thrown at him on the pitch from the stands. Yes, yes, oranges, toilet rolls. Yeah, that's were thrown at uh, Jim Layton, among other things. Get hit with a loaf, I mean, a loaf of bread. Scotland would have a poor match in stark contrast to their early season form. Spain would win the match with a goal in the 48th minute from debutant Francisco Clos. Butragene would pass to Senor, who crossed from the right and Clos headed the winner. Obviously, Spain's win was not as impressive as Scotland's win against them, but a win's a win. And this match kind of started Scotland's problems for the rest of the year. I don't and think they ever thought they were going to win this match anyway. I think that you always look at that and you think, as long as we beat them at home, we don't mind getting beat away from home. And I suppose Seville was pretty intimidating atmosphere, so you're always up against the cautious such. So I think 1-0 people were really taking that. Say yeah, that. That's Archie Ball with the Barcelona link, that would have been something back then, I would imagine, because the Catalan thing, he would have probably been the most hated person on the pitch that day. Also, the Spanish league, they had postponed their matches for that particular week to prepare for this match, while obviously the English and Scottish leagues, as always, had fixture congestion, etc., etc. So that was always a running problem for British football for these types of matches. Yeah, I guess maybe it just seemed like a logical loss. Maybe it was expected that they would lose and kind of get back on track with the following matches. Yeah, I think I was very much the thinking back then. Up to this point, has Wales had their victory over Spain yet? Because isn't that one of the results that really opens the group up? That's in April 30 with, uh, yeah, the Mark Hughes overhead kick yeah. and all that. Yeah, That's, that's meant so to the game that really opens this group up. I'm yes, sure. yes. Because it showed that defensively Spain were frail and all that, even though they would eventually win the group. But you're right. It did kind of open things up. As far as Scottish interests, the next match on March 27th at Hampton Park against Wales. Everyone would have expected for Scotland back at Hampton to kind of get back to winning form. But this match compounded Scotland's troubles with its early 1985 calendar year. The home championship had been disbanded, but this match obviously kind of has a feel of a home championship with Wells. For this match, Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen Gold, Steve Nicole of Liverpool back in the side, Arthur Alveston of Man United. He'd be replaced by... Alan Hansen of Liverpool in the 57th minute. This would be his only cap of this calendar year. And I'm trying to remember, was his last cap in 83 before yeah, that? Yeah, again, yeah. Swept, so at home. First yeah, we've kind of discussed his troubles with the national team yeah. since the World Cup yeah. and all that. I think it's yeah. like 18 months since his last cap. Right. Like yeah. So then you got McClish and Miller of Aberdeen. Graham Sunes. Captain beside Sampdoria in Italy, Paul McStay of Celtic. He be replaced by Charlie Nicholas of Arsenal in the 75th minute. Kenny Daglish of Liverpool back in the side. James Bett of Lokeren in Belgium. 
Mo Johnson of Celtic, and Davy Cooper of Rangers Glasgow. Quickly going through the Welsh side managed by Michael England, we have Neville Southall of Everton. And we should mention that Everton will be league champions and cup winners cup champions that season. They were having an excellent season that year. Neil Slater of Bristol Rovers, Kenny Jacket of Watford, Kevin Ratcliffe of Everton, Joe Jones of Chelsea, David Phillips of Manchester City, Robbie James of Queen's Park Rangers, Peter Nicholas of Luton Town, Ian Rush of Liverpool, Mickey Thomas of Chelsea, and Mark Hughes of Man United. Wells would score their winner in the 36th minute. So essentially from the middle, James headed towards the edge of the box. Mark Hughes fought for the ball and he just dropped for Ian Rush, who just volleyed a beautiful shot from the outside of the box to give Wells the winner against Scotland. I'm assuming the press reaction for this loss would have been understandable. Yeah. I think the Evening Times went with what a load of rubbish. Sad Scots were just a clueless collection. I, th- I think the idea is that it was a British type game and Wales were up for that in terms of, you look at there's a, many a battler in that Welsh side. For Scotland, there's a lot of finesse in midfield, I suppose, with McStay and Bet and Cooper. In, but in terms of battlers, you've probably got Sunnis and that's it. It's interesting, from the start of this campaign, Roy Aitken has been stuck in as an overage peer, player in the under-21 squad. So he comes into it later again, I think, and it's about having that bite in midfield that they obviously missed that night. Although Sunnis himself was in a spot of bother for a tackle against Peter Nicholas at one point that you know, ended up in a bit of a barney, but he ended up getting booked. This was the last home match of the qualifiers, in fact. Paul, what do you remember? Yeah, I think as David says, this is going to be one of those tight physical games. Wales, I think at that time, they've got some outstanding individuals, but you wouldn't have said they were a great team. But Neville Southall, they've got possibly the best goalkeeper in Britain at the time. And Ian Rush, almost certainly the best striker. And Mark Hughes really emerging that season as well. So definitely a, a tough game. And I think looking at it, maybe a bit of a surprising result that, that Wales um, nicked this one. But yeah, Ian Rush, obviously the, the difference. But this be the infamous game where Ian Ferguson is supposed to have went to Douglas Hansen and Nicola asked for information on how to keep Rush at bay and they didn't give it to him out of teammate uh, loyalty and stuff like that. Because that's one of the rumours that Hansen didn't go to the World Cup because he wouldn't give information on Rush for one of the Wales games. No, I don't know about that. May have been the later one, maybe? I don't think Hansen was in the squad for that one. Difficult to know how to stop him at that time. And and that sort of goal as well. It's not a lot you can do. No, there's not. I mean, it, some of the papers were saying that, well, Jock Steen had said that he thought that McLeish had been filled by Mark Hughes. I just think Hughes had been strong in the challenge. You know, what you would expect your forward to be. We come towards the end of the season. A couple of months after this match, May 25th. We've discussed this before, especially in our England podcast, the Rouse Cup, that essentially... After the disbandment of the home championship, Scotland and England decided to continue their annual matches between them because that was the only moneymaker as far as the matches uh, with the home nations. This was the very first year of the Rouse Cup named after Sir Stanley Rouse. Obviously, in a few years, it would become like a three-team tournament with a South American guest. But at least for 1985 and also 1986, it was just between England and Scotland. So this match on May 25th, 1985, was played at uh, Glasgow's Hampton Park. And it was not held at Wembley for security reasons. So also, we have to mention that this match took place 
just a few days before the Heisel tragedy between Liverpool and Juventus. So obviously, Scotland's Liverpool contingent were missing. Dalglish, Nicole, and Aberdeen's Neil Simpson had to withdraw. Albison was also injured. So for this match, Scotland would unveil their new shorts, their new Umbro shorts with a thick navy blue strip that I guess it's a classic now. So, and uh, we remember it from the 1986 World Cup. For this match, Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen in goal. Richard Goff of Dundee United. Maurice Malpas making his first appearance of the season from Dundee United. Alex McLeish, Willie Miller of Aberdeen. Roy Aitken of Celtic making his first appearance of the season. Gordon Strachan of Man United, he replaced by debutant Myrtle McLeod of Celtic in the 71st minute. Capping the side, Graham Sunes of Sampdoria in Italy, James Bett of Lokeren in Belgium, Steve Archibald of Barcelona, Spain, and another debutant, David Speedy of Chelsea. And quickly going through the England lineup, you have Peter Shilton of Southampton, Viv Anderson of Arsenal, Kenny Sansom of Arsenal, Terry Fennick of Queen's Park Rangers, Terry Butcher of Ipswich, Glenn Hoddle of Tottenham, he replaced by Gary Lineker of Leicester in the 79th minute, capping the side Brian Robson, Man United, Ray Wilkins of AC Milan in Italy, John Barnes of Watford, he replaced by Chris Waddle of Newcastle in the 63rd minute. Mark Haitley of AC Milan in Italy. And Trevor Francis of Sampdoria in Italy. Side managed by Bobby Robson. So for this match, Scotland would score the winner in the 70th minute. Alex McLeish found Jim Bett on the left side. Bett crossed for Richard Guff who headed in around the six-yard line into the goal. Immediately afterwards, Jock Steen sent on McLeod to tighten the midfield and hold on to the win. I guess it was a scrappy match, as most England-Scotland matches are, but good Scottish win for the very first Rouse Cup match. What are your thoughts? One of the things is when the, the squad was announced, Jock Steen had decided his front two for this double header because the Iceland game's only three days later. It was going to be Graham Sharp and Andy Gray, who were obviously winning the title with Everton that year. But the English FA had decided that Everton had to play a game on the Sunday, the day after. So he was he was raging with the FA because not so much for the England game, but for the Iceland game a couple of days later. So it was a sort of makeshift in some ways in terms of his planning because he didn't plan to go with David Speedy. I'm surprised because I think Everton were already champions at this point, right? So all their matches would have been inconsequential at this point. I'm they thinking. were. They were, but yeah. still, I, I don't know if it was to do with relegation issues. Is that, uh, because the Cup final or something. No, that no. was before. That they, was like maybe played, a couple. Of, yeah. But I might have had a game to catch up with because of that. They played Coventry in the Sunday and get beat 4 1 by Coventry because they won the championship. They're probably not caring too much. Yeah, yeah. Um, as to the game itself, I think one of the things is that we need to know at this point is that I've said that Sharp and Gray are his jock team, was, that was going to be his plan, but he's kind of dropped Mo Johnson in some ways as well. Yeah, he's vanished the last few games. He, oh, he's, yes. he is a sub. You see him in some of the photos with, it, mm-hmm. with it, the team in the, in the peeing rain, you know. But it, it, was, it wasn't a classic match, I suppose. Most people were saying it was kind of, we won and that was it in some ways. I was um, winning, winning a cup. The other thing was the goal itself. Somebody in one of the papers had 
said it actually looked like a, a rugby goal. Because if you watch it, the Scotland players are spread right across the area and the ball gets played right across. No, it's, it's short passes and then it gets to bet who finally hits this and it go off who. Seems to be tow- you see the photographs and Goff's like towering above Butcher, I think it is. Yeah, I think that's the thing that you have with Goff as a right back at that point. He mm. was able to pop up as he does in the Cyprus games. He's able to pop up. It's a wee bit later he becomes Goff the centre-half, but he's still Goff the right back because Dundee United, he can't get a game in that position. Um, it's a wonderful header. It just really puts it as well done. But obviously, the more important match was a couple of days later on May 28th for the last match of the season. It was a World Cup qualifier at Reykjavik against Iceland for this match. And again, this is the day before the Heisel tragedy. So obviously, the Liverpool contingent are still missing. You have Jim Layton of Aberdeen in goal, Richard Guff of Dundee United, Maurice Mapas of Dundee United, Alex McClish, Willie Miller of Aberdeen, Roy Aitken of Celtic, Gordon Strachan of Man United, capping the side Graham Sunes of Sampdoria in Italy, James Bett of Lokeren, Andy Gray of Everton, making his only appearance of the season. Was this his very last match for Scotland, I'm trying to think? He was on the bench in Cardiff a few months later, but yeah, no, I think he might have again. A Andy Gray was replaced by Steve Archibald of Barcelona in the 76th minute. And finally, Graham Sharp of Everton, making his debut for Scotland. Yeah, in fact, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have it. Yeah, this is Andy Gray's 20th and final cap. Yeah, that's, that's... And Sharp's first, yeah. And yeah, his first cap had been in 1975. So he made 20 appearances in 10 years. And we should also point out that Scotland wore their yellow kit, or yellow away it. kit for the first time. <laughs> Going through the Iceland lineup, you have Egert Gudmundsson of Halmstads in Sweden, Thor Grimur Trainson of Valur Reykjavik, Janus Gudlaksson of Fortuna Köln in West Germany, Magnus Helgi Bergs of Eintracht Braunschweig in West Germany, Saivar Johnson of Valur Reykjavik, Arni Svensson of IA Akrans, Sigurdur Johnson, or Sigi, as is known in England, of Sheffield Wednesday. He had joined Sheffield Wednesday that season, and we all know he would later join George Graham at Arsenal and even Dundee United later on. And he was replaced by Omar Torfason of Fram Reykjavik in the 26th minute. And getting back to Johnson, he was injured by Graham Sunes. That's why he was replaced in the 26th minute. And in fact, Sunes was booked. There's a story that later that night, Rod Stewart recognized Johnson and spoke to him and bought him a drink and so forth. I don't know if that's part of a Scottish football legend or you know if it's true or not, but I've read this. Probably only Rod Stewart could afford a pint in Iceland at that point. <laughs> so you have Atli Edvaldson of Fortuna Dusseldorf, Gudmundur Thor Jornsson of Valur Reykjavik, Tetur Thor Darson of Iverdon in Switzerland. He replaced by Sigurdur Gretarsson of Irakli Salonika in Greece. And Petur Peturson, a Feyenoord in Holland, side managed by Tony Knapp. In fact, because of his booking, Graham Sunes would miss the following match. We should also mention that Thor Darson missed the penalty kick in the 33rd minute. And, uh, I had it saved. She obviously it's a good save from Jim Layton. You know, it's down at his left post. He's done well. Scotland won the match with just minutes left in the 86th minute. So Strachan sent in a long cross from the right side. And at the far post, James Bett just volleyed it into the far post. And it was a very, it was a nice goal and gave Scotland the win, a key away win. 
and put them back in contention for qualifying. What do you guys think? I think if you listen to the commentary, you, you, you hear Ian St. John shouting quite loud at the goal, you know, and that's probably the way we all felt about it because it was really it was a hard game to watch. It was a hard slog. But without the win, we would have had to be going to Wales having to win. So it made a big difference. It was a very much needed win. It remains to be seen whether Daglish had been present or Nicole had been present, whether things would have been different. But I expect it would be a scrappy match. As far as the Scotland national team, I think it's like a night and day if you compare the first half of the season and the second half of the season. Because in the first half of the season, they were a consistent side, settled side that scored lots of goals. The second half of a season, it seemed like they struggled. If you think about it, if you take it, take away the Wales game, then I think it is a pretty good season. It, it's just that defeat to Wales that just throws everything. I was at eyes. One nil, losing one nil in Spain. That's nothing really to be embarrassed about. If you take mm. it, it's just that Wales results the blemish in that season. And it, it it throws a wobbly to the whole qualifying thing as well. Just the way it seemed to go. We started really well, and then, as you say, we just lose that game and the wheels fall off the batter because you've lost two games in a row. Suddenly, at one point, you've got six points, and Wales have none within a wee bit. Wales have got six as well, having beaten Spain 3 0 at home. That was the thing. I mean, Spain were never reckoned to travel that well, as that was always the thing back then. Oh, they don't travel well, the Spanish. I think they say the same about the Portuguese at the time as well. So it wasn't unexpected, some of it. But it is, it, it's all about the Wales game and how badly they played, how mm. the lack of fight for that particular match, I think. Also, because of injuries or unavailabilities, there was not a consistent side in the second half of the season. That's why you get the likes of Goff and Malpass make more appearances in the second half of the season. And like you said, you have to resort to recall of Andy Gray, debuts of Graham Sharp. And you see, like you, like you mentioned, Mo Johnson kind of disappeared in the second half of the season. Yeah, this is a funny one because you can see Nicholas, Nicholas has been dropped because things aren't going well for him at Arsenal. Arsenal's not playing well. He's not playing well. Archibald's having a great season at Barcelona. But I've got this... This quote here about Archibald after the game in Spain. This is from Alan Davidson of the Evening Times. The Barcelona striker is Spain's leading scorer, but it's difficult to see how he has managed this distinction. He lacks the real quality required for the international game, and after over 20 caps without any significant contribution, he clearly won't be the answer. So Archibald wasn't particularly liked at that moment either, so... And the striking position does become the whole thing over the next year as well. We go into Mexico and we head. It's all about who's going to play up front. Right, right. Scotland had a big goal-scoring problem into 1986. Yeah. And it seemed that way because he certainly settled. Jock Steen has settled on Muller and McLeish after a long time. Experimenting with others. He seems to think what everybody else is thinking. They should have been there for the start together. That's the thing, his team seems to be a mixture of the Aberdeen team and the Liverpool team, with like Sunis added in and one or two here, which at that time you probably could understand why he's doing thinking like that. Also, it looks like McStay is also not in this last matches. He also kind of disappeared from the side in the second half. But obviously, he would remain in the side for the foreseeable future. The scheduling of these games hasn't done anyone any favours either. It's hard to imagine that now that you'd put a crucial game right at the very end of a, a really long season that most of these players have been playing in European competition as well. And it's three days after an England game. It's going to be physical. It's, it's more or less yeah. the same by the strikers in Iceland. You know, it's, it's impossible to imagine that now. And, you know, no one really thought anything of it at the time, but you're never going to get players playing at their best when they've played 60-odd games on 
heavy pitches at the very end of a season. It's it's really strange that Iceland game being sort of tagged on at the very end of this season. Well, it feels almost like the England game is kind of shoehorned in there because usually that's yeah after, probably been played after earlier. Yeah. season closer, but it just feels like kind of shoehorned into a spot because the team are together for the Iceland game, so they'll play the England game as well. Also, remember, England had to go on a tour of Mexico right after. Overall, obviously, the following season would have far greater ramifications as far as the Scotland national team. At this point, qualification is on, even though I think at this point, Spain just had to win against Iceland to outright win the group, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the only match that's led, that was left on their end mm-hmm. in yeah. September, if I believe. So at best, probably at this point, Scotland knew the best they could hope for was a playoff. On balance, what are your thoughts as far as who stood out and uh, maybe who should have been called up that wasn't anyone come to your mind? No, I think, again, I think they'd done well with some of what they had in terms of Jim Bett. He'd had an excellent season. Davy Cooper had done well. But like a winger, he flits in and flits out of games. And that way, McStay had come on as well. The defence is fairly steady. Miller, McLeish, Nickel, Malpas, Goff, they were all good players. Um, so I don't think they've done too bad. It is the Wales game. It goes back to that as well. And Mo Johnson, I don't know why he suddenly get, doesn't get picked. There is one thing where he's, he's talked, Jockstein talks about Charlie Nicholas and Mo Johnson, both like being out in the town a bit. So well, there's a bit of that with Mo Johnson at this point. He's, because he, he did see that the thing about Mo is he seems to revel in it. It builds him up to a game, whereas for Nicholas, it just seemed to take away from his game. But whether it was too much for the likes of Jockstein, I don't know. Maybe the signs were there that what was going to happen in the following season in terms of Mo Johnson and not getting to Mexico. Paul, what about you? What do you overall think of this season? Yeah, the, I mean, the great, great results at the start. And just when you look at the, the players available, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of strength in depth there. And I think as as we've touched on, the strike has become a problem. but there seem to be so many options that it's just a matter of finding the right combination there. I think Graham Sharp just comes into the team. He's won the league with Everton and one of the best centre forwards around in Britain at the time. Yeah, Mo Johnson and Charlie Nicholas may be more of the problems off the pitch. Kenny Dalglish is still performing at a really high level. David Speedy's sort of had a bit of a breakthrough with Chelsea that season. Paul Sturrock doesn't seem to be used as much when he's featured at the start of the season and mentioned well, seems Archibald. Seems to be a lot of, to be a yeah. lot of Dundee players have vanished from the squad of late. They yeah, that's strange. They, they, were quite, they were quite heavy in the Euro qualifiers, but they just seem to be disappeared so far for the World Cup. It's only really Malpass and Goff. Yeah, David yeah. Neary seems to be missing. Yeah, Eamon Neary Bannon is Stark. out of... Eamon Bannon's Bannon. not been called up, yeah. yeah and good. who else... Bannon, Neri, Stark. Oh, yeah, Neri, yeah. He's, yeah. That's well, Billy Thompson's gone as well halfway through. Right. He's replaced by Alan Ruff, who's come back into the squads at this point due to his, his games with um, Hibernian. Oops. I think Gary Gillespie, I think he's starting to come out at Liverpool. He played in the final, didn't he? The Heisel final. I'm, I'm trying to remember. He played in that match. So he's starting to kind of find his feet at Liverpool. We kind of mentioned the previous seasons. He had joined Liverpool from Coventry, but it'd be a while until he would make his breakthrough. But other, but like you said, in defence, maybe he's not I really needed the at defense this point. is not an issue. Yeah, exactly. to really look at that. So obviously for the following season, there's even much more to talk about. We'll discuss in depth next time. Once again... We would like to thank Mr. Stewart and Mr. Gillis for their participation in this series. Always feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me 
on my blog and on Facebook, I'm under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on his blog, The 1888 Letter, or on Twitter, he's at, at 1888letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Stewart can be contacted on Twitter at DAVSTU11. And there's also a link to his uh, website, scotlandepistles.com. Mr. Gillis can be contacted on Twitter at Wanderer1982. And of course, all this information is listed on the blog and Spotify uploads. Once again, thank you, gentlemen, and look forward for the 1985-86 season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Yeah, look forward to catching up again next time. Yeah.